Good day, everybody. Alessandro. And uh, as an Indo-Europeanist and historical linguist, um, I found it interesting to give a historical twist to my research here. Um, the topic is how the Swahili loanwords are treated in uh, Gorwa and Iraq. And uh, for the purpose of this presentation, Gorwa and Iraq are not different. As uh, Andrew was saying, there are very few differences and with the treating of long words, there's basically none. You can find a couple and also uh, the corpus of long words uh, shows no difference. So you can have a word for car uh, recorded at least in Gorwa and a, a word for box recorded in Iraq or words that are uh, recorded for both languages and they're the same. Um, the long words from Swahili are usually words that are already long words in Swahili. So this is also interesting because the objects and uh, modern institutions are often long words from Arabic or Persian or English, of course. And uh, the first part will focus on the morphology of the long words. And the second part tries to explain how these long words are treated in a roughly three uh, different ways, uh, ways and that, that uh, correspond to three possible layers of influ uh, Swahili influence on Gorwa and Iraq. And of course, the, uh, the last one is still going on to the present day. So the index, first uh, I'm gonna show the sound changes and this is based on uh, Harvey Mbreta, a uh, uh, paper about sound changes and how uh, the Swahili loanwords are, treat are treated uh, phonologically. Then I will focus on how the Swahili morphology, nominal morphology works, and also on how the Gorwa, but, but for the purpose of this presentation, also the Iraq uh, nominal morphology work. And then how the words are adapted. And then we are gonna look at the periodization. So uh, there are seven uh, major sound changes in play here. So the, the first one is the voicing from Z to F and from B to P. This is mostly present in earlier borrowings. Later, this uh, sound change doesn't uh, apply always, uh, of course, because the more uh, you go into the present time, the more the words are just treated as Fremdwörter. And then an in interesting aspect is the fate of the initial syllabic nasal, a uh, prominent feature in uh, Swahili. And depending on when the word was uh, borrowed, you can see a different treatment of the syllabic nasal. This is uh, um, early borrowing, camel, and it's treated in this way, but we are gonna look at it later. Um, then another important sound change is the uh, vowel syncope of the antepenultimate uh, vowel before the stress. You can see it here, but again, this only happens with regularity in the early borrowing. The most important sound change here is the lengthening of stressed vowel. This happens almost consistently uh, in every layer. So you can see here that the, the stressed vowel is lengthened. Uh, a minor sound change is this pedagogical uh, uh, glotted work here from the cho to cho o. This happens not very regularly. It, I don't know if it depends on the speaker or uh, whether the, the speaker was uh, intentionally uh, Iroquoising the word, but it's not very um, regular. And this is the seventh uh, sound change is quite regular, is an insertion of a glide to avoid hiatus. So this, or a complex uh, vowel um, cluster. So from barwa, you have barwa. So uh, this way, you know, have morphology, quite interesting is head first, so everything that uh, is used to change the word from um, single to plural happens in, at the beginning of the word. So for example, uh, the word for person, mtu, becomes watu, people, persons. So everything it happens uh, at the beginning, it's head first. Uh, its gender is opaque, meaning that there is um, not an avert grammatical uh, sex uh, difference. Uh, you can see that ye ye is in English both he, she, also it, there is no neuter. So uh, every word, every noun doesn't have a gender. Person is neither masculine nor feminine nor neuter. 
is just part of the first pair. So uh, class number one, Mutu, class number two, Watu. Um, so the vowels at the end of the word don't en uh, encode anything. So in this case, it's Mutu, but in the case of tree, it's Mti. The U and the I are just a uh, relic probably of an older stage of the language or uh, um, are borrowed from uh, English or Arabic, uh, just as I as, or you, and are sometimes even paragogical. So you have uh, the word for car and it's uh, gari with this paragogical I. So you can see that the words are uh, grouped in pairs. The uh, Iraqi nominal morphology works in a completely different way, almost uh, opposite. So it's head final and it's fusional. And therefore the suffix, which uh, encodes the singular or plural and the gender, feminine, masculine or neuter, is after the stem. In this case, zle, cow, has a stem, zl, and a suffix, in this case, feminine, e. And the linker, well, the linker is very complicated, but it, it uh, plays no role in here because um, words in Gorwa in Iraq can all also end just with a suffix. Um, and uh, interestingly, the suffixes and the pairing between singular and plural, and also singulative and um, whatnot, is unpredictable. So as um, Andrew was telling us in class, it's just based on, on uh, memory. <laughs> he had asked to know the plural of the word. There is no way to understand it. Well, at least for inherited words. For later borrowings, it's pretty um, uh, regularized. In this case, you have the word for uh, armpit, slaru, and the plural, oh, slaru is masculine, and the plural is neuter. And you have uh, the word for pain, and in, in you, okay, here, doesn't matter because the suffix is amu, and the plural is feminine. So it's, Unpredictable, let's not say chaotic, but unpredictable. Um, and the grammatical genders of singular and plural do not have to agree. In this case, you see uh, from masculine, the plural is uh, feminine. So this is the perfect recipe for reinterpretation. Okay, so uh, borrowings can have um, meet three fates. So uh, co a total nativization, and this of course applies especially to early borrowings. And how do they nativize the words? So uh, they can reinterpret and reanalyze um, a singular uh, a word from Swahili and reinterpret it as singular, again, in uh, their Iraq languages. Or they can interpret the singular as a plural, or the plural as a singular, or just take the plural and base the, the singular or the singulative on the borrowed plural form. Let's, we'll see later what this means. So, um, the uh, reanalysis can go in four ways, three, four uh, different uh, possibilities. So, uh, this is the most common one, of course, from, a, from a, a singular Swahili word, you have a singular borrowing. The, we're looking at the word for uh, a book here, in Swahili, kitabu, well, the plural is vitabu, because it's a, Key uh, V now. Uh, the Gorwa and Iraq languages uh, borrowed the singular. You can see that there is uh, the lengthening of the stressed vowel. So this is supposedly uh, early borrowing. Kitabu. And the plural is um, um, derived from the singular Iraq form. So the, the plural is kitabemo. Um, from a u suffix, you get a emo plural suffix. This, uh, being an uh, early borrowing, follows the native Gorwa and Iraq uh, singular plural pairing patterns. You can see that the final i in Swahili can be interpreted as a um, e suffix in uh, Iraq and uh, Gorwa, like in the first example, gazeti. The Iraq word for a newspaper is gazeti. But again, the plural for Swahili is magazeti. So, <laughs> so something completely different. 
and the uh, final a can be interpreted as uh, final a with a suffix feminine final u is interpreted as a uh, final u masculine in gorgo and iraq and for the final o in the Swahili loan words well it's a bit more complicated because uh, there is no real o suffix in the gorgo and iraq and they are treated uh, uh, morphologically as u even though uh, phonetically it's a o but uh, it can go it can go um, in a, diff a different way so uh, a singular form in swahili for example kiazi which is potato uh, is borrowed as a singular kiazi vitazi vitazi is the yeah, swahili plural but you can see that the plural in gorwa is kazi so they took the singular word and they reinterpreted it as plural and from the plural they uh, derived a singular uh, form again using the inherited Gorwa and Iraq uh, singular plural patterns. So you have kazi plural and singular kazito. Okay, you can uh, have this also for a and i because um, suffixes like i and a are not inherently singular, it can be both singular or plural. It depends on how you pair the, the two singular and plural. So um, you can, we can have Ngogo, which is um, um, a people group uh, around, around there, I believe. And uh, the singular, not the plural, is Magogo. So they took the singular form and they reinterpreted it as plural. And from there, they uh, derived a singulative, Magogo Mo. This is especially true for uh, people's groups that are in the proximities of uh, uh, the Gorwa and Iraq peoples. For uh, um, other nationalities, um, being more recent borrowings, it works differently. Um, yes, they could, uh, Gorwa and Iraq could borrow the plural and interpret it correctly as plural. And from that plural get um, uh, a singular in the inherited way, the original way, let's say. So you have MT, Miti is a plural, they got Miti, and they derived Mitmo, which is one tree. And you can see it also for oranges and uh, warriors. Interestingly, because warrior in Swahili, uh, it's also not only gender opaque, but also um, uh, it's singular and it's neutral, uh, it's plural are the same. So Askai can either be warrior or warriors. In this case, um, the Iraq got it from uh, as a plural, and they uh, derived a singulative form, warrior, uh, Askar Mo. So this was the total nativization. Now we get, in the more recent borrowings, a different uh, patterns. So I call this Swahilism, or also mixed Swahilism. We are gonna see what, what's the difference. So for a word to be considered Swahilism, both singular and plural, should be uh, borrowed separately. So in this case, soko is market. Uh, in Swahili, you have soko, one market, masoko, markets. And the Gorwa Iraq word, or at least what was recorded, <laughs> is soko, singular market, and masoko, plural markets. So this, of course, is not the inherited way to get a plural from a single or a single from a plural. This means that both words have been borrowed separately. Uh, another way to have um, Zwalism, a uh, mixed Zwahilism, is to have both words, both singular and plural forms, uh, both separately, but adding something, uh, adding an uh, Iroquois feature to the mix. So we see Jimbo, which is state, is Zwahili, and plural Majimbo, states. And in Gorwani Iraq, you have Jimbo, state, but then Majimbo, do. So Ma, the ma uh, prefix was just taken from uh, a Swahili word, and then they added the inherited plural suffix odu. So they added basically one prefix and one suffix. You can argue that the prefix was not, was not added, but just uh, taken uh, in the borrowing. But we're gonna see that uh, this prefix, this uh, um, foreign prefix has been borrowed as a prefix, so as a working prefix to um, 
create a new plural. So we have three layers. Uh, the first layer, what is going, what is being borrowed? We have uh, agriculture, basic object, and neighboring people. The phonology, all the sound changes are, are applied. So total phonological simulation, or partially total, depends. And uh, the syllabic nasals are uh, kept or and are reworked. So from uh, original m, you can get uh, uh, an. So with a uh, svarabakti vowel to help uh, pronounce the uh, nasal. And the morphological derivation is unpredictable, but this is uh, correct. This is the original way, the original Iroquois way to pair singular plural and singulative. So let's see the three examples. So we have uh, wheat, which is an agricultural item. Uh, ngano is in Iraq, angano. So we have the uh, lengthening of the stress vowel and uh, syllabic nasal is retained and reworked. And you have the singulative form formed from the single, uh, from the, yeah, from the single uh, word. So angano, anganomo. This is the inherited way to uh, pr uh, produce a plural. Then we have Swahili Mali, Iraq, Iraq Mali, and Malu. So this is, uh, looks extremely ancient because this derivational pattern is uh, uh, original in the Iraq language, but is not to be found in later borrowings with pairing E and U. And then we have uh, Wachaga, a uh, Chaga, person, Chaga man. Uh, then they uh, borrowed it as Wachaga, Chaga people. And so this, we, we have a singular form reinterpreted as a plural form. And then from the plural Wachaga, so Chaga people, we have a Wachaga Mo, a Chaga person, a Chaga man. The second layer, during probably the colonial period, we have advanced objects and also new people. So for example, the English, but also the Arabs and the Indians. Um, the assimilation, the phonological assimilation is limited so some um, sound changes we looked yeah, before are not applied, but the uh, lengthening of the stress vowel is still applied regularly. The syllabic nasals are deleted. They don't um, uh, reinterpret it, they don't transform it, it's just deleted. And morphologically, we have a more predictable uh, pattern. So from a vowel, you get um, a suffix do. So for example, with O or with U, we get Udu as plural. And if the word ends in, uh, ends in E, in the singular, the plural is I. This is more uh, predictable, more regular. And this is not what we would like to find in original Gorwa words. So for, let's see, uh, road, uh, Barabara, we have Barbara, and the plural is Barbardu, almost regularly. So, and again, uh, boxy, it's a box, uh, it's reinterpreted as singular. Boxi is the plural. And for example, uh, the word for English, you can see uh, a phonological assimilation. So it's not taken uh, one to one, but um, it, it's borrowed as face value. So Kingareza, it's been borrowed Kingareza. No, nothing changed, nothing has been added. And the third layer, the last one, we have a contemporary lifestyle, advanced institutions, so for example, hospital or state political parties. There is almost no phonological simulation. You can uh, maybe find the uh, lengthening of the stressed vowel, but that's not uh, uh, always. And the syllabic nasal are uh, kept without simulation, are just kept as they were uh, Swahili words. And the pluralization is predictable, you also have Swahili prefixes used when the Swahili words didn't have that prefix. So, for example, the word for uh, sock in Swahili is soksi, which can be one sock or two socks. And the plural in uh, both Iraq and Gorwa is soksi. And this pairing, I, I, is not inherited. This must be treated as a Swahilism. Then we have the word for ocean, Bahari, and Iraq has been borrowed as Bahari, and the Iraq plural is Ma Bahari, 
that's uh, very strange because the Swahili plural for ocean is bahari. There is no ma before. So they uh, borrowed this ma prefix and they're using it to create plurals even though the Swahili word didn't have it. And again, a penbetatu triangle in Gorgo is penbetatu and the plural is ma penbetatu. So they have the prefix ma, which is not present in the Swahili word. And they also added uh, original uh, Gorwa suffix a to, to pluralize it. So uh, triangle, triangles. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, I think uh, your presentation was really uh, interesting. Um, I think uh, the detail uh, in which you went to sort of um, divide up these uh, different lexical mm -hmm. items sort of and, and propose this periodization is very interesting and I think it's and I think it's something that's it's very exciting for people who are interested in questions of what did you know what did the what did Gorwa and Iraq sort of historical contact with Swahili look like over you know the clearly over a century in which you know this contact has occurred at any sort of you know at any sort of great intensity um I suppose one question, and I'll and I'll start off with a beginning question, just to, so everybody else can sort of think of of, of theirs and uh, and and either write them in the chat or raise their hand. Um, uh, and I don't know how easy this would be to answer, but I I wonder I wonder from which Swahili this uh, these words were borrowed, um, mm -hmm. and it's a difficult question. For us, for us to sort of answer because I know that it's it's very commonly said, and I think it's true that you know not all Swahili speakers speak a standard Swahili, which is obviously the forms that we would have uh, we would have access to. So the dictionaries that we're using to compare the Swahili forms are dictionaries of essentially standard Swahili, whereas. Mm -hmm. uh, on the mainland, on the Tanzanian mainland, um, and especially in the area where we are working, so the area in which Gorwan Iraq are spoken, um, yes, you do get mainland, or you do get standard Swahili, but you also get sort of a mainland uh, Swahili, they would call it Swahili Chabara, uh, and it might not even be considered Swahili, Ki Swahili Chabara, the continental Swahili. It may actually be, you know, even a more um, even a more sort of localized Swahili. So we look at, for example, the word vita becoming fita, for example, mm -hmm. or even, even the word, even the word go go instead of uh, mm -hmm. go go and wa go go. Mm -hmm. in, in in Iraq and Gorwa, we have go go and we have ma go go, right? Or we have yes. ma go go and ma go go mo. Yes. Um, it's interesting in that sort of on the on the mainland versions of Swahili, uh, often this ma prefix is very, very um, commonly used to pluralize. So, you know, a speaker of a speaker of mainland Swahili may actually say, uh, may actually use ma to pluralize uh, a lot of uh, different nouns from different classes. So we might have mchaga and we may have ma chaga. Um, and I guess the question is, uh, do you think that these borrowings were borrowed from sort of, should we be using standard Swahili as our, as our model for borrowing, or would it be more useful to use sort of a, a mainland Swahili as our, as our standard for borrowing? So all the Swahili words uh, I treated, um, I found them also on uh, standard Swahili dictionaries. So, right. um, and also, uh, well, your research on the Swahili words as uh, phonological nativization. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I found them also uh, written like you brought them on yeah. uh, Swahili uh, dictionaries. And not only you, but also uh, the Iraq English dictionary of Professor Mouse. So it looks like they were um, original uh, standard Swahili words. Right, right. It's especially, of course, in the lay and the later. Uh, um, in the second and the third layer, maybe the third, the first layer, uh, we can we can discuss about it. 
Right. But uh, not to the second and third. The third, and especially the third, is a standard way you live for sure. I think it just underscores the fact we need somebody to do some research on the Swahili spoken in our area. Unfortunately, I don't know if anybody's done anything uh, very in depth yet. Um, but yeah, I think I think that I think that um, the uh, I think that the reasoning that you give I think is is pretty sound. Richard Griscom has a question. He's raised his hand. So Richard. Uh, Feel free to mm -hmm. ask. Uh, thanks. Yeah, just to follow up on uh, this one particular feature of the devoicing of fricatives. Um, so yeah, I've definitely observed uh, people speaking Swahili in northern central Tanzania uh, devoicing their fricatives um, and being members of a variety of different ethnic groups. And sometimes uh, I found it to be very localized. Like if I was uh, in Mangola near Lake Ayasi, maybe they were not devoicing the fricatives, but then one valley over, some people were devoicing fricatives. Um, but I, I found that particular feature to be quite widespread. Um, and so that I, I think is, uh, is interesting in relation to this discussion of which variety of Swahili were we're examining because you might uh, find a word like vita uh, mm -hmm. is pronounced fita um, mm -hmm. by a, a wide variety of different people and it, it could be sort of a regionalized version of Swahili um, which may contribute in various ways to people's expression of their identity or their allegiances. Uh, one other item I'm curious about, and I think Andrew and Martin will have more to say about this than me. Uh, so kiazi potato. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a very similar form in Datoga, uh, gasis, or gasis. And I'm curious if this originally comes from Bantu or if it has some other source. Um, I don't know myself. And then uh, I just have one question uh, regarding the different patterns that you observed. So I'm curious if you ever saw an example of unambiguous plural morphology from Swahili. So something like wa, meaning uh, multiple animate or human uh, referent, uh, but then that form being mm -hmm. analyzed as singular. So I, I don't think I saw any examples, but I just wanted to confirm that you never saw something like wa to than being analyzed as person in the singular. And thanks again for the no. presentation. No, um, you, can, you can find it in uh, the um, borrowed words for foreign nationals. So the word, for example, for um, Arab or Indians. And no, you don't find the wa treated as a singular. Also because, uh, well, it could be, you know, because the wa is a prefix and for the Gorwa, Prefix is, prefixation is not a thing, but uh, it doesn't happen. It could happen, but it doesn't. Right. Thank you, uh, Alessandro. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Richard, for the uh, question. Clemens has a question. He asks, do borrowed non-nominals also follow the same patterns and layers you described? So I guess he's- I, also, I only researched nouns. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> yeah, that's the answer. That's okay. Yeah, and that's probably enough, really. I mean, there's, there's a lot going yeah. on. Uh, okay, great. Um, Martin Mouse has some comments. Um, he asks, or he sort of comments, he says, it would be nice if, if you made it clear how you arrive at your periods. Is it from the adaptation, and then you look at what kind of words, or do you decide the period from what kind of word, and then, the, and then make the conclusion about its properties? Well, no, um, I looked on uh, how the word has been phonologically nativized, how it, uh, the morphology worked for that uh, specific item, and also what uh, item has been borrowed. These three things work together to um, suggest me the period, but also the periodization uh, was the newest part of my research. So the, the previous paper was only about the morphology. And right. then as a follow-up, I, uh, I worked on the periodization, but th that is still a work in progress. Okay, okay. This is, the periodization is very, uh, is very interesting and I'm excited to see uh, where you go. Because, um, for sure you have two periods. So uh, 
ancient one and a recent one, a contemporary one. Mm -hmm. um, I added the second period, so the colonial period, because of the um, type of items, but also uh, mainly due to the total absence of uh, the syllabic nasal. And you only find uh, this um, sound change in uh, uh, words that indicate uh, foreign items, but objects, you know, so you have uh, paper, but you can have uh, uh, road, that sort of item. So uh, modern, but not so modern, like a hospital or um, internet or a computer. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Martin uh, also says that he agrees with my earlier statement in that which Swahili is an important point. Mm -hmm. Um, and he says, however, the thing with Ma is that also in general, Tanzanian Swahili people use Ma for collective or to make it overtly plural. So it's not really wrong in standard Swahili as, uh, to use Ma for plurals, as I may have implied. Okay. Uh, he also offers a reference here. So Roland Kiesling has an article on inland Swahili based from sources in the 1930s. So that might also be an interesting uh, reference to look at. And uh, we can make a note of that and provide that to you. Um, I see uh, a few other uh, notes. Um, uh, Liz uh, sort of uh, comments that maybe it would be better to say prefixal versus suffixal instead of head initial versus head first when discussing where gender is marked on the noun itself. Mm -hmm. The latter terminology is useful when discussing the position of the noun versus its modifiers in the noun phrase more generally. Does that make sense? I take the point. Yes, it, it looks uh, more in line with the, the nominal morphology. Yes. And, uh, and of course, just for you and, and the other presenters as well, I can make sure that I provide these comments uh, to you uh, individually in the end so we don't miss anything. Liz also wonders if there's an orthographical issue tangential to the phonology. For example, you said the second vowel in kitabu gets lengthened to mm -hmm. gorwa kitabu. But this could just be an orthographical representation of Swahili's penultimate stress. So in Swahili, we have kitabu. You'd never say something like mm -hmm. kitabu or kitabu. Mm -hmm. um, so Swahili pronounces it kitabu. Uh, but rather than an actual change in pronunciation when it's borrowed into Gorwa, maybe this is just an orthographical um, extension. Well, not really, because, um, for example, when you have a singular word, uh, for example, again, uh, kitabu, uh, borrowed in Gorwa, you have kitabu, okay, but in, not in this case, but in um, in the case the plural had a long stressed vowel, then the long borrowed vowel is shortened. Right, so this is... I don't have a... an example here, but for example, there is a word with a long stressed vowel from a stressed uh, Swahili uh, vowel, then the plural has a long stressed vowel. And therefore, the original um, long stress vowel is uh, shortened. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, it's worth so it's a true that. short uh, long vowel, not only uh, orthographic representation. Also, because uh, orthographical uh, Andrew made the orthography, so <laughs> I'm following him. <laughs> you can lay that at my feet. <laughs> uh, I mean. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, it's worth having a chat later on with Martin and I uh, regarding uh, Gorwan Iraq stress versus tone, etc. Mm -hmm. um, Yenika van der Waal um, asks or, or sort of comments, she says, I, I was a bit thrown off by your saying that Swahili or Bantu does not have gender. This is true for natural gender, which I would probably say is biological sex. Uh, so this is true for natural gender, of course, but the noun clan class system can be and is seen as an elaborate gender system. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but I am an Indo-Europeanist. <laughs> well, really, <laughs> you can say that and it, it's absolutely true, but I think that also what I say is true. It depends how you look at it. We, uh, I think it's worthwhile having a, having a, a bit of a discussion on, on, on how people have sort of come to terms with how basically the, the Bantu system is essentially gender, but just categorized mm -hmm. in a different way. But we can have a chat mm -hmm. about that um, as you uh, continue uh, working on your- This is why I said it's divided in pairs and each pair yeah. has two uh, classes. This is how I would describe it in a, a neuter way, you know? Right. Without saying gender. 
right? Um, yes, and uh, Yenika also uh, notes, what sort of exceptions do you find for the periods in terms of the morphophonology and or in terms of semantic areas? So was there anything in your periods that you came up with that you said, ha, huh, that seems like it's strange that it was put into that period. It looks like it's maybe a word that doesn't fit there in terms of its modernity or in terms of its Oh, yes. Process. Yeah. Not every word can and be pinpoint, pinpoint to a precise period, okay? Um, so there are certain words that for sure be, uh, belong to one of these three periods, but um, for some words that, for example, couldn't undergo any phonological change, but well, mm -hmm. then it's uh, more difficult to, uh, um, to decide where to place them. Right, so, right, that makes yeah. sense. Um, okay, given that we are now at the top of the hour, um, I'd just like to say a big thanks, Alessandro, for uh, presenting your work. Um, obviously, you. um, I can, uh, uh, the attendees here have, um, have your contacts, uh, and they can obviously send uh, emails and comments. Um, and I think, yeah, we're all excited to uh, see uh, your further work as it uh, develops mm -hmm. further. So thank you. And uh, now we will uh, move on to Clemens Mayer, who is going to uh, give us a talk on discourse organization and referent tracking in Gorwa narratives.